Happy Monday, everybody. We're probably going to have a pretty awesome week of PlayStation news. And I thought, what better way to kick off my Monday than by talking to you guys about Ghostwire Tokyo. Now, this is a game I've been very, very, very excited for ever since its inception many years ago. And we finally have it. And I spent the weekend playing, I'd say, about 10 hours or so. I feel like I have a pretty good understanding of what the core gameplay mechanic is going to be like. And while I can't yet comment, nor would I want to, on the story elements in terms of spoilers and where the kind of story and the setting is going, I think I could do a really good job of telling you what I think about it. And a game that I would like to say up front and early, I do recommend you check out. This game seems to borrow a lot from other franchises I like, which I think really helps quite a bit. I feel that sometimes I'm playing an arcade game where, you know, Arcane is known for their world-class level design, which obviously, considering it's under the Bethesda umbrella, very strong chance that some of the Arcane folks did help out, or if they did at least take some inspiration from other Arcane games. It has a little bit of Skyrim in it, and it has a little bit of Fallout 3 in it, and it has some of this just quirkiness in it that you see in other JRPG-centric games. So there is definitely a lot here to borrow upon, and I know a lot of those games I mentioned do fit under the Bethesda mold, primarily because they're made by Bethesda, and I think that that's the best compliment I could give this game up from and early. If you're a fan of Bethesda-type games, I think you need to check this one out. It's not as deep or as um, loot-driven as other games in the Bethesda universe are, however, I feel like a lot of those key tenants do trickle their way into gameplay. In terms of just how it looks in the presentation, it looks phenomenal. Now, they went really, really over the top here with, I think it's like 10 or 11 different possible graphic modes you can have on the PlayStation. Far, far too many. If you really want a good deep dive of what each of those do, I recommend checking out the Digital Foundry video where they deep dive all of these I can tell you guys that I did in fact play this on the 120 frame per second mode on a nice fancy shiny new TV, but I also prefer to, uh, but I also have played it on the performance mode, which kind of dials it back to the 60 frames a second as well. Um, I, if you know me, I think 60 frames is the new gold standard, so I didn't check out anything below that, but I'll say that it looks beautiful. The game is always taking place either in the rain or <laughs> it had just rained. That's kind of the style of the game. So you get lots of really bright neons and bright colors and storefronts and displays. And then you also get the reflection of all of those things. Additionally, your character, which I'll talk a little bit about the magic element in a moment under the gameplay section, um, because of all the magic you're using, lots of particle effects and smoke and explosions and lots of bright vibrant lights which really draw a stark contrast to kind of the dark foggy gloomy brooding world you see the combination of the two creates a gorgeous aesthetic one that makes you feel very powerful number one when you're casting these spells but number two just looks gorgeous during the exploration phase and if you're like me you want to check every little nook and cranny there's a ton of stuff to do in this world so you're going to be walking around quite a bit getting yourself into trouble in many different ways and I think it all looks and feels phenomenally well um, and, and I think that is a I think that's a testament to just how sound they've made the level design and how they've kind of focused your eyesight on specific things and obviously there's map markers and stuff but you really don't need those you you can very quickly tell what's important to see I'm not saying it's uh, the ghost of Tsushima level of, oh, follow the bird and the horizon kind of thing. But I will say that for the most part, when you're out and exploring, if you don't want to keep checking your mini-map, you're going to find things to get into. And I, I attribute a lot of that to the graphic design, which I like a lot. The audio, I think, is serviceable. I haven't yet had a chance to really check it out on my nice uh, shit hell 2 with my super fancy Sennheiser headphones yet. But from what I have heard, it sounds okay. I don't know... A lot of this game um, really relies on the DualSense controller's speaker. When ghost or ethereal characters are talking to you, 
there is a slight delay between what you hear in your speakers as well as what you hear in your DualSense controller. As a result, you get this kind of uh, ethereal type of you know ghostly sound almost kind of resonating in the background while you're playing. Don't know how well that will translate into headphones, especially the headphones I use, where you're probably not going to get a lot of audio leakage in, especially since I'm playing them so loud. Particularly if you're somebody who has a closed bag headphone, I don't know how much that translates over when you're just hearing like the quote unquote pure audio from the game itself without that amplifying sound effect from the DualSense speaker. So keep that in mind as well. But it's serviceable and I think it does a good job at least of kind of setting the mood uh, as well. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention really briefly on the graphics piece. They've done such a cool job with the aesthetic. There's a lot of Japanese uh, symbols that are written out that actually demonstrate what you are seeing. A perfect example is the raindrops. The raindrops are actually the uh, Japanese symbol for the word rain. And those are actually falling down. It's not like little droplets of water. And it looks really beautiful and it gives you this almost matrix vibe at times that really lets you kind of almost see the words. Not that you know what they mean, but clearly it's not rain. It's something different. And I think they've done a good job with that. And you'll find that interlaced throughout the game pretty much everywhere where you'll see words and replacement of the actual objects and things like that. And I think that's a really cool touch as well. Core gameplay um, reminds me a lot of like an Assassin's Creed type game where you're going up to these gates. You are unlocking gates, which gives you a bunch of things to do on the map. There are collectibles everywhere. If you don't want to spend time exploring, which I recommend you do, um, I recommend you just kind of ignore the mini map and go off and get into your own trouble. That's when I have the most fun with this game. But if you're somebody who's much more goal driven and you want to be to told to go right here, uh, the mini map is uh, incredibly serviceable at giving you directions to pretty much any collectible or any gate or any side quest or any mission or anything you have to do. Very rarely we have to stumble around and try to figure out where things are. Everything is laid out in nice grids and zones to show you how many collectibles you have from that distinct area or how many treasures you're still looking for if you are a true completionist. Um, I have done most of the side quests, not all yet, at least so far as where I've gotten in the story. And I'm having a fun time with it. Not every side quest is a home run, but I don't think that they're as watered down as things like I saw in Assassin's Creed um, Ragnarok, for example, where I felt like it was just way too many side quests that just really went over the top and you were just basically doing a lot of nonsense stuff. I think this has a good mixture of side quests between just goofy and some that are a bit more serious, which I like. Um, and, and that's a lot of fun. The main missions are fun as well. I don't want to get too much into those because I think the story, like I said, I'm not that far into the story. But uh, it seems like it's going to be kind of the traditional. You have the big bad and the lieutenants. You got to take down the lieutenants in order to take out the big bad. I don't know if I'm going to get any revolutionary design or game plot here. Maybe you will. I don't know. Um, these are the same guys that made Evil Within and Evil Within 2. And there were a litany of plot twists, particularly in Evil Within 2, that really caught me off guard, particularly at the end, some of the twists there. So if even a fraction of those make their way into this game, I think we're all going to be in for a big treat. Uh, and I like that a lot. Um, definitely where this game shines, without a doubt, is in two key areas. First of all is in the graphics and the hand motions. This game is taken entirely from the first person perspective. So you're always looking at your character's hands. Your character, the way that all the individual fingers are modeled with the lighting effects for all the spells is some of the most beautiful handiwork I have ever seen in any game. The way you manipulate all of your fingers to like create an orb to shoot or the way you link your index fingers and your thumbs together to create like a triangle or a, you know like a heart or something to like push attacks out it's awesome and it looks so beautiful in gameplay i mean obviously i'm looking at what i'm aiming at but i can't help but notice just how amazing the hand gestures are they spent a significant amount of time modeling these hands they look insanely insanely cool and you're going to be casting a lot of spells obviously but you're also going to be casting a lot of um different abilities to open. Sometimes you have to trace a pattern using your right analog stick and the way your character does that, the way you manipulate things, the way you uh, enter in a number on a telephone pad or the way you eat food and it looks like you're licking your fingers after you're done eating. 
um, they've done a really good job of bringing you into that universe because in a first person game, it is hard and the game does, you know, the camera does jump around between first and third person during cutscenes. But in the moment to moment gameplay, seeing your hands in a very realistic way almost feels like VR in a sense. Like if you're thinking about like pretending to shoot magic spells and you're like whipping your hands out in front of you and like stirring the crock pot or doing any kind of goofy dance moves, you're probably manipulating your fingers and trying to make look, looks like you're maybe creating a ball out of thin air or sliding car, a deck of cards over the top of your hands or something along those lines. I feel like the creators who made this system had a very vivid imagination and what magic spells may look like from somebody who's casting them by shooting bolts of energy or fire or water off their fingertips. And it's really, really cool. Uh, so I can't recommend just checking it out, if nothing else, for some of those animations because it was incredibly impressive. But I think where this game shines as well in a very key area is, and especially since this was kind of, you know, a console exclusive for the PlayStation 5. Uh, I don't know if it's timed or not, by the way. Maybe somebody can correct me in the comments below if this is eventually coming over to the Series X. But holy smokes, the dual sense haptic feedback is it's this is another showcase game for that. And I'm 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 constantly being blown away by what Sony has been able to do with the dual sense controller. It's it's nothing short of revolutionary and incredible. I've talked a lot about Astro and Returnal as being kind of showcase games. I would argue that this game absolutely falls in line with that. I would even say Grand Theft Auto V, the online portion I talked about. I think they did the video last week or the week before. It all blurs together. Um, it, it's This dual sense is really becoming the hero of the PlayStation 5, and that's so cool. Uh, the, the raindrops, the individual raindrops falling in your head will plink and plop on the controller. Um, as you open and move and manipulate the world, you feel as if your character using those hand movements are doing those things. The difference between a wind attack and a water attack and a fire attack, the way you draw back a bow and arrow, the way you open a door, the way you pet a dog, the way you glide from rooftop to rooftop, they all feel incredibly different. It's really, really amazing. And you can almost kind of feel that magic surging out of the dual sense into your hands, particularly in the really powerful fire attack, which is a big explosion, lots of AOE. You don't get a lot of shots with that. It's kind of like your finisher. Um, casting that versus casting a little bit weaker wind attack, which uh, can be charged up, but even just like the most basic of attacks, you can feel it when you melee or when you block. Um, when you're jumping or climbing a ladder, every little motion is translated in such a distinct way. I feel like you could blindfold somebody and say, what am I doing in the game? And they would be able to tell you just by the feel of it. And you would definitely understand when something is channeling and powering up as opposed to just something that's a little bit less in damage. And you find that in combat a lot too. You can tell when you hit an enemy hard, you feel it in your hands. Um, it's a very impressive system. And I have a feeling, obviously, because this was designed for the PlayStation 5, the developers took great care into kind of molding that system. And I feel that's where PlayStation exclusives really do shine, is you do get that added attention to the controller. And it does radically change the way this game is played. If you were playing this on an Xbox pad, or, I mean, obviously, keyboard and mouse, you wouldn't, you wouldn't feel anything. But if you're playing on an Xbox pad, yeah, it would vibrate. You know, all the games vibrate. When you shoot your gun, it vibrates a little bit. You reload, it's a lighter vibration versus, you know, shooting a rocket or something like that. But I, I know that, and this is a guy who loves his Elite Controller Series 2, who plays Monster Hunter almost daily with it. It's my daily driver on the PC, but it, it's another level with the PlayStation controller. And it's something that is definitely, that needs to be celebrated and something that definitely needs to be highlighted. So... Is this the game of the year? No. It's a lot of fun, though. And I think if you don't mind, you know, putting up with some of the generic exploration tropes, I think you'll find there's a great game in here. I think a lot of care has been taken into the game world. A lot of care has been taken into the combat and everything like that. And I feel like you put all these pieces together and you do get a really good game. Um, as with all of my big reviews or reveals on these games you know i will come back at some point when i finish it and give you guys my final thoughts we'll get more into the story spoilers at that point but this is just a love letter this is just somebody who's been playing this game 
and, and really enjoying it. And I felt like it needed to get some of that. You know, I want to throw some TLC out there. And like I said, this might be a really big week for Sony News. So we'll have to stay tuned and see what happens next. But for now, that's going to conclude today's, today's video. Uh, leave your thoughts below on Ghostwire Tokyo. Let me know how far you've gotten, what you think about the game so far. It's everything's going to be overshadowed by Elden Ring, right? But I feel like this is definitely one to discuss. That's it for now. Take care of yourselves. And until next time, I will see you guys on the other side.